Hey, I was, uh, in, in preparation for this message, I was, uh, I was looking back on life at a, at a couple social, social shifts that I feel like I've experienced in my lifetime. Uh, the first one is this, it's the front porch. Uh, the first home that I owned uh, with my wife uh, was built in the 40s or 50s, had this big, elaborate front porch. Anybody remember like big front porches like that, covered, like it's kind of designed to be a gathering space right? And uh, if you look at homes nowadays, like they would kind of look at those homes from the 40s and 50s and go, what were they thinking? Why, why all that space on the front porch? Because like I remember growing up that uh, there, there was some comedian that explained this, and it's 100% true, that like when your doorbell rang when I was growing up and your doorbell rang, you were so excited, like somebody was there to visit you, and you were like, man, who could it be? I, like in my life, it could have been Danny across the street. Maybe Jacob rode his bike over. Uh, like I'd have these lists of people that maybe would come by, and I'd get so excited. Who's here to see us? You guys know what it's like nowadays, right? Your doorbell rings, and you're like this. You're like turn the light off, you know, like you're slouching, make sure the dog doesn't like bark, like, man, no one's home, no one's home. Uh, I remembered uh, the moment that I realized that our student ministry shouldn't go caroling anymore. You know, this is the most cringeworthy moment ever. Now, I don't understand why anybody wouldn't want two school buses to pull up with middle school and high school students and like band instruments and make a racket in their front yard. Like, first of all, that was a little bit of social awareness that I should have had that maybe that's a little awkward. Uh, but there was a time and place where that would be exciting when that showed up. And I remember the moment we pulled up to this one house and uh, we stopped the buses, everybody unloaded. Like we would put together music with like, uh, like brass instruments and stuff. I thought it was a pretty cool thing. You'd have a plate of gifts. We walked up to this door and I kid you not, we rang the doorbell and uh, we, <laughs> we saw curtains move and they turned the porch lights off. And like, it was like, like, it was like, well, uh, all right, guys, let's get back on the bus and go. A little bit of like, and, and I'm wondering what happened to front porches. And I had a friend last night tell me it was very simple, central air conditioning. Like front porches existed for when it was hot. People would come out on their porch, cool off, right? He was like, it was that simple. Central air showed up. It drove people inside. And uh, uh, so the other piece that I feel like I've witnessed in my lifetime, we all know this, like it's the advent of the cell phone, the smartphone specifically. Um, where I see this the most, I think, is like uh, where people have to wait. Like anywhere where adults are waiting nowadays, um, Back in the day, like, it kind of turned into a social environment, you know? Like, if you're standing in line at the, the checkout stands, uh, you were a little distracted. You would catch up on uh, the tabloids and whatever, whatever gossip was going. You'd just sit there and stare at Snickers bars and tabloids. And then, like, you might, to the person next to you, go, hey, you believe what's going on there? Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. The other places, like, where uh, preschoolers get picked up, like, moms used to, like, swap recipes and like hold each other's babies and all of this. And like now it's like, now it's like everybody's just like this. And I'm not going to be the old guy ranting on smartphones. Hear me in this. The reason I bring these things up is the way that it's kind of driven our culture towards isolation. It's a reality that exists. Uh, more and more we have to fight to kind of come out of our shells, to engage with people. Uh, there's not as many just natural areas where human interaction happens. And I was thinking on my, on my drive to the, the church today, like how there's some people that it's probably just genuinely a laborious work to engage with people. And, and like that has really, really changed. And it's one of the ways I, in looking at this message in these um, these labels that we wear, I realize we're in the midst of this spiritual warfare in our world. And uh, much like the way a lion would try to isolate its prey so it can surround it and destroy it, our enemy is doing the same thing. He wants to find ways to isolate us, uh, to pull us away from community, to, to get you alone so that he can fight the battle on his ground. It's almost like, in a way, the way a crocodile would pull its prey into a river and get it away from the rest of the herd. And, and I was thinking about this because me growing up, when I would think about spiritual warfare, I would imagine, like, me setting up my G.I. Joes and tanks on this side and, like, my Transformers and He-Men. Like, they don't go together, but they do. On the other side, and, like, I, I pictured, like, spiritual warfare as battle lines that are drawn, but it's not the way it is. 
The way that spiritual warfare works, it's more like Russian spy bots where we're trying to manipulate your thinking. We're trying to change the way that you look at yourself, trying to change the way that you look at your relationships, trying to change the way that you see God. And and it's so much different than what we would imagine. And so this morning, I'm wanting to engage in that with you. And so if this is your first Sunday here, I want to say welcome. I'm hoping that you will have the opportunity to see the way that God sees you. I want you to be able to look at yourself the way that God sees you instead of the way that the world around you sees you. And that may be a brand new phenomenon to you. You may be like, uh, I, I can't even wrap my head around that. I want you to give God a chance this morning. And if you're not new to church and you're like, hey, this is part of my routine, I'm hoping this might be a reminder and you might catch yourself going, you know what? I think I bought into that lie a little more than maybe I thought. And it maybe has a little bit of root that I wasn't ready for. So I just want you guys to give whichever side of that coin that you're on, I want you to give God a shot this morning, okay? Uh, We're going to start. And so in order to, like if, if the enemy attacks us and his weapon is lies... That means the weapon that God will use is the voice of truth. And where we find the voice of truth is from Scripture. And so we're going to spend a ton of time in God's Word today. So if you have the YouVersion app, if you have your old uh, analog uh, copy and you want to use that, I want to invite you to get your Bibles out because we're going to spend a lot of time in God's Word this morning. Uh, I want to start this morning with Psalm 139. And the way that I want to use this, you guys, is a little bit like a prayer. So if you want to read along on the screen, it's going to be up on the screen. If you want to close your eyes and just listen to the spoken word, I want you to feel free to do that. Uh, You need to know that the author of Psalm 139 was no stranger to spiritual warfare. Uh, The writer of Psalm 139 likely struggled with what people thought of him. He had a checkered past. He was an adulterer, a murderer. Uh, you would say that his story was maybe a little, little more dirty than the next person, and so he had a bit of a past. Uh, he also knew what it was like to be rejected by friends, uh, to be betrayed by close, close, close companions, and uh, to be confused about trying to live out what God was wanting him to live in a world that was kind of against him. He was no stranger to that. So that is the author of what we're getting ready to lead. So read. So I want you to hear these words as they're read. Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in before, behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will, be not, will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am with you still. The words of a man that fully understood who he was and what God thought of him and understood his identity as defined by his creator. The first thing that you need to know when it comes to how God sees you is you are known. You are completely known, Third City, by your creator. Just like David, this writer who had a checkered past, God knows your story. He sees the details of it, and he's not embarrassed. He's not intimidated. 
He's not ashamed. Why would you be? And so the first thing that we need to know is that we are known. We are known by God. And we find a great example of this in John chapter 4 when uh, Jesus is walking through a hot, arid desert area and he's ready for a break. It's the heat of the day. He sits down by a well and he is, a, and he is approached by a, by a woman that is coming for water. It says, uh, it says uh, right here, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone to town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So to set the, to set the stage, here is a woman that was struggling with being known, and we know this for a couple reasons. You don't go to draw water in the middle of the day when it's hot out. We're smarter than that. When it's 110 degrees in Nebraska, you don't schedule to do, if you can help it, you don't schedule to do your outside work at 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Am I right? You would mow your grass in the morning, or you might mow it in the evening, or you might wait two weeks till your neighbors turn you in to the, the guy that drives around in the car and says, your grass is too long, you know? Like, we just don't do that. But she was obviously avoiding community and was wanting to not to be anonymous. She was choosing isolation because of her story. There was something about her story that she just didn't want to engage with people. Third City, have you ever been in that kind of place where you're like, you know what? There's enough pain here. There's enough hurt here. I could just do without people. It's a lie the enemy wants you to believe. The enemy wants you to believe that somewhere in the midst of your anonymity and your isolation comes some form of healing, and you miss out on the best of what God has to offer you is when your story is known in an environment where you can be loved. That's where healing comes. Here's what happens. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. He's, look, he's saying, look, I got something better for you that you don't even know how good it is. And her response, because of the pain of her story, she keeps him off like this. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep going, what could you have to offer me? You ever been there with God saying, God, what could you have to offer me? Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks and his herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. He's saying, look, you're missing it. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman's interest gets piqued right here. She goes, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Saying, what? you might have something to offer me. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. All of a sudden, in a blink, her story is made known to the God of the universe. I can't imagine how in that moment how she would realize that she has been exposed. It's like, my story is now known. And she's looking at this man going, it's obvious that you're, there's something more to you. What are you going to do with the information now that you have it? You guys ever been in that situation where someone learns a piece of your story and you kind of go, okay, so what are you going to do with that? Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Your Samar you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, 
For salvation is from the Jews, yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God, excuse me, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So in this moment where she wonders if she's going to face rejection, Jesus offers her acceptance. The woman said, I know that Messiah that you're talking about. She said, I know that Messiah called Christ. I know he's coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus does something with a Samaritan outcast woman that he doesn't do with a whole lot of people through the New Testament prior to his crucifixion. Jesus declared to her, I who speak to you am he. He chose this woman in spite of that story to go, look, I'm going to trust you with this. And you've heard me accept you, and I am this one that you were saying that you've been waiting for. I don't reject you. So don't worry about whether or not the world rejects who you are because you are known by me. And it says that she takes that message and she leaves rejoicing and she re-engages with her community. It talks about her going back and telling everybody about this man that she met, Jesus Christ, and who he was. And like I imagine how, like, like how the community probably reacted, but she didn't care because Jesus had placed immense value on her life. Which is the second thing that I want you to walk away with today, knowing that not only are you known, but you are valued. And this is a piece that as I was reading, I went through this morning as the worship team was rehearsing, and I was just reading the the signs, and I don't know who wrote what. I will tell you the most common phrase that I saw on these boards has to do with value. I saw this phrase over and over and over, I'm not enough, I'm not worthy, I'm worthless, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. I think on this board alone, that phrase, not worthy, is written at least six times. Who declared that you're not worthy? Who declared that you're not enough? It's somewhere where we've allowed the enemy to speak lies into our minds, and we've forgotten what God has said about us. And that's why I love going back to the voice of truth. We're going to go back to Scripture in how we see God speaking, speaking words of truth um, to a woman uh, that was in, in desperation. And it was a woman that I guarantee felt so low about her value that, that she felt desperate that she had to do something. Uh, Jesus was walking down a road with his disciples, and he had been performing some miracles. And so what uh, he was actually headed to, to, to heal a, a, a young girl that was sick and about to die. And um, the, cre- the streets were crowded. And I don't know if you've ever been in one of these crowded situations where it's like so uncomfortable you can't move. Uh, there, I thought of two places. Uh, it could be your, uh, your middle school open house when they, when they cram everybody in the hallways Uh, because they add all the students plus all the parents, right? And you're like sitting here going, what are we trying to accomplish here? Like it's really crowded in these hallways. Or the, uh, for high school students in the room, the 200 hallway, right? Like you guys know what that's like. Or if you've gone to Nebraska uh, football game and you're trying to get to the bathroom and back at halftime. Those are the, the, the places that I was imagining. So Jesus was in this circumstance, surrounded, packed by people. And this woman goes, this is my only shot. He's the one that can offer healing if I could just touch him. And here's what, here's what happens. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus said. And this next phrase kind of makes me chuckle when they all denied it. Uh, which means like all the disciples were going, I didn't do it. I didn't like any of you guys with kids. Not me, not me. Like they could tell something about Jesus's tone, made them uncomfortable. And parents, you know, when you ask, and it doesn't matter if all three of them did it, they all just go, I didn't do it. 
Like, you guys have seen that. Uh, there's, I must be the only one in my house. Um, but uh, when they all denied it, Peter was courageous to go, um, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. It's like, you're getting, like everybody's touching you. Like, and Jesus goes, no, someone touched me. I know power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of all the people. She told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. I think about the moment that what Jesus could have done. He could have been disappointed of her trying to take advantage of him. She could have been like, hey, this wasn't the time or place. Hey, like there could have been a lot of things. But because Jesus saw value in this woman, and I love how consistently in a culture, in that culture, uh, women's, women's lives didn't have a ton of value. It was a very sad, sad, sad thing, that, but Jesus consistently spoke value. He looked, he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Like in a moment that he could have been rushed, he could have moved on quickly, he took time to stop and look at this woman and go, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. In addition to this, there's another piece of Scripture, and I, can't, I just want to read you guys the Bible all day this morning because it's full of all of this truth that just brings so much hope. Uh, Zephaniah is a, it's an old prophet. It's a small book. It's only a few pages. It has one of, my, one of my top five favorite verses in it that I believe gives immense hope and speaks value to us as people. It says this, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. These next two lines, you have to listen close. He will quiet you with his love. He'll rejoice over you with singing. Have you ever thought that your life, that you had lived your life in such a way that would warrant God rejoicing over you with singing? Am I the, maybe I'm the only one that struggles with that. Why in the world would the God of creation want to rejoice over my life? With singing, and then as I started to think about this, I, you know, our church is full of babies and 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 uh, toddlers, and like I think about this moment of a parent. Whenever you look and you see, even if you've never had kids of your own, and you watch someone holding a baby, there's a news flash. That baby has done nothing to earn the approval, to earn the value that the parent places upon that baby's life. That, that baby has done nothing. Does that make sense? Except that child has immense value. Why? Because the child is. Because that child exists. It has value. And then it clicked for me with Zephaniah 317. If God was 40 feet tall and I was somehow some big, big man baby, he would hold me. And when life got difficult and I was emotionally out of control and just crying because I was exhausted, he would quiet me with his love. Shh, it's okay. He would rejoice over me with singing, not because of anything I've done. <laughs> I'll be completely honest with you. But simply because I am his is why he rejoices. And that's hard for us to accept as people, which leads into our last thing that you need to take home today. Third city, you are deeply, passionately loved. And I don't mean that you're loved in a bachelor, bachelorette kind of way. You're not loved in, a, in an Instagram way. You're not loved in a... You're not loved in a... In a, in a restaurant with roses and wine and whatever else you would add to that scenario, you are loved in the purest form of love that has ever existed. You are loved in the most sacrificial way. That is the most romantic. It is the most beautiful and is the most pure form of what love is. And our culture has just so distorted it. Love is sacrifice. In Luke chapter 23, we find Jesus demonstrating the full extent of his love. He had been beaten with whips, uh, been stripped of his clothes, 
been nailed to a wooden beam and placed at eye height so that he could be mocked, he could be spit upon, he could be lied about, he, insults could be curled, hurled at him. People could punch him if they want to. And he was hanging on that cross innocently, taking a punishment that I deserve, taking a punishment that you deserve. And he was crucified between two guilty criminals. And we pick up the scene right here. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus, said, aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and save us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. We are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. This man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, you just picture this criminal turning and going, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, you will be with me in paradise today. And I think about that, that, that thief on the cross, he had no moment to go to church, to serve anywhere. He had done nothing to earn what Jesus had to offer because that sacrifice was pure. His love was pure and it was offered freely. Third city, the moment that you think there's something you've got to do to earn the grace of your Lord, remember that moment because that thief on that side had done nothing to earn what Jesus was offering. And we get that, we get that mixed up so often. We think that there's something that we have to do to earn it. And I feel like as much as I get to make, have an opportunity to hold a microphone and preach the gospel in front of people, I can't help but bring myself back to Romans chapter 5 that says the same thing in a different way. Starting with verse 6, it says, You see, at just the right time, when, when we were powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and me. We're the ungodly. Very rarely anyone... Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for you to get it perfect. And every week, we have this moment that we call communion. And when you walk in, you see people offering you this bag with a piece of bread and this cup with some juice. It's a moment that we get to remember that Jesus knows our story, places deep value upon our souls, and offered himself as a sacrifice of the purest form of love so that we might have unity with God the Father someday. It's like vows are renewed. We remember the sacrifice. And we say, God, I, I need you all over again. And we remember a piece of our identity. So Third City this morning, when you are ready, I invite you to commune with God, remembering those things. So like Dan said, last week we, um, we approached these boards and Words were written like worthless, useless, monster, unworthy, addicted, loner, fake, wash up, has been, not enough, drunk, divorced. We have all these labels, and I, I picture I truly picture the Christ that was crucified stepping in knowing the wounds that he bore for us, going, who told you that? Because they're a liar. Whoever told you that this is you, they're a liar. And so what we're inviting you to this morning is to, to choose a label from the voice of truth. If you need some help, you can simply write, I'm known, I'm valued, I'm loved, if it needs to be that simple. If over the course of these next two songs, you're going to hear a lot of phrases that start with I am or singing truth, 
If one of those phrases connects with you, come, we want you to come up here and to write it on one of these name tags. And you'll take that name tag with you. If Man, if you're just so pumped about it that you want to slap it on as you walk out the door, wear it for the rest of the day, wear the same shirt for the next five days, have at it. Not look forward to your coworkers. But we want you to own the truth of God over your life. Maybe you take that sticker and you put it somewhere where you're going to see it every day. Maybe you'll wear it to work tomorrow, and your, your coworkers will go, why do you have a purple name tag that says, hello, my name is loved, and you're going to go, you know what, for the first time, I just realized I didn't have to work to earn the love of my Savior, and it'll start a conversation. I don't know what you need to write on here, but I, I feel like the Holy Spirit is going to move you to write something, and I want you to resist the lies of the enemy that says, you don't need to do that. Let's pray and let's continue worshiping together. Father, thank you, Lord, for speaking truth into who we are. Holy Spirit, I invite you into this moment. I know that you are here. You are ever-present. Holy Spirit, would you continue to move in the hearts of the hearers, in the minds of these believers, to step into who you say they are, to walk away from the lies of the enemy. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.